Do you like to play with blocks? Why, yes, I do. I think it rocks. I think it dirts and I think it sands. And I think of terracotta in the Badlands. Before you know it, you've got a home. Made from thoughts, determination and bone. Blocks, that is. But I come to no harm. Because I made a skeleton farm. And now it's dark, it's time for bed. Unless I want to end up dead. I'd better fly on Elytra wings. To my base, full of cool things. Beware or you might be out of luck. A creeper can still just blow you up. What is there left to say about Minecraft? A game that long, long ago exceeded any boundaries or limits a game might usually have, and has since swept onward into the realm of significant cultural phenomena. A friend of mine asked me at a party once to explain to him the whole Minecraft thing. He works with children, but being an adult who isn't completely obsessed with video games, he was not especially familiar with Minecraft, outside of the kids he works with, obsession with it. Neither of us were what you would call sober at the time, but I found myself launching into a whole impassioned speech about it, without even considering what I was saying. I knew I was passionate about Minecraft, but that moment really crystallised it for me. I told him that Minecraft was less just a game to these kids, but an actual, tangible, culturally significant part of their lives in a way that those not immersed in it may find hard to understand. It isn't just that it is some of the most popular content on YouTube, with I believe well over a trillion hours, making it an industry unto itself. It isn't just that there's merchandise so you can own a pickaxe or a torch in real life, nor is it that there are spin-off games and crossovers with other media like Adventure Time or The Reference in South Park or Rick or Morty, or you care to name it. I compared the Minecraft zeitgeist to what, for previous generations to my own, experienced with rock and roll or with rave culture. Not in that it's about music and partying and drugs and such, but in that it spawns its own celebrities which get worshipped and aped almost religiously, to the point where for most of these kids, they grow, up, they grow up with becoming a Minecraft YouTuber as their dream job of choice. Like wanting to be a rock star, an MC or DJ, and you need only spend five minutes on YouTube to see the legions of kids reaching for that esteemed Minecraft star success. People will play on a large famous server, or watch the chronicles of players on famous servers, and then start their own, like listening to a great album and starting your own band, or going to a great party or festival and starting your own sets. Individual builds are like songs that you cover or remix, and servers are like albums or sets. There are so many ways to play Minecraft, whether just approaching the vanilla game in a different way, or with mods, data packs, or tools. I compare it to subgenres within subgenres that proliferate in popular music. Speedrunnings like Frantic Bebop, UHC like Hectic Hardcore Punk, Park Hour like Slick IDM, Vanilla SMP like Accessible Reliable Pop Music. You could go on like this forever. And I'd love to see some of your own comparisons of Minecraft subgenres to musical ones in the comments. Most of all, it fundamentally lets people express what's inside of them in a creative way. It grants agency and connects people's internal worlds both in and outside the game in a way that only full-blown cultural movements can. Make no mistake, to ignore Minecraft is to ignore a defining wave of meaning and culture that will leave its mark on history. I think if the human species makes it another hundred years, we probably won't still be playing Minecraft in quite such a serious way. But historians looking back on our time will look at it the way we look at old big band jazz or the heyday of opera. Sure, it's still a worldwide culture that's practiced regularly. It just won't have quite the same kind of mega stars at the cultural forefront. Nobody worships Kamasi Washington quite the same way they did Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong or John Coltrane, or even the way they currently do in hip hop with Kanye West. Not that Kamasi isn't an incredible and successful musician beloved in his own right, 
and deservedly so, just that the heyday of jazz is past and the context of being at the forefront of that zeitgeist is past as well. I doubt players with the success, both in fame and monetarily, like Dream or Technoblade, may he rest in peace, will be common in the far future, although in my estimation, many a Minecrafter may become more popular and successful than those in the near future. But who's to say? I'm not claiming to be able to tell the future here. I just want to talk about the block game. So, what new things are there to say about Minecraft anyway? Well, I'm not promising to blow your mind and radically reorient you into some kind of pure Minecraft being, as cool as that sounds. No, what I'm here to do is get down and dirty into the blockiest little bits of the game and really think about what it is doing, how it operates and why it is so effective to have achieved such phenomenal success. And I don't mean in regards to the code or the engine or from a software develop development point of view, but rather in terms of how the game interacts with you and your storytelling brain and how it is so many things to so many people. Minecraft is a cunning chimera that always responds to however you seek to interact with it. And thus, this video will also be deeply personal in terms of how I play and what I get out of it. But by no means am I trying to exclude or gloss over other ways of engaging with Minecraft. It's more that I'm using the tools at hand, my own experiences and capturing my own gameplay. And so the nature of this video will revolve around it. I fully admit to this being anecdotal, informal and discursive. And that's all it's really seeking to be. In a way, that chimeric nature is one of the truly cunning points of Minecraft's design. And while not the first game to do it, I think of Gary's mod or the gold source engine and all of its mods like Counter-Strike or Team Fortress Classic and many other older titles whose engines and bones became platforms for entire universes of gameplay variations, modded experiences and total conversions. I think anyone who's ever played a round of Surf on Counter-Strike followed by Gun Game and then Trouble in Terrorist Town might understand me here. Despite these titans, none, I feel, have ever been so thoroughly integrated into their own colossal universe, exclusive with adherence to its own internal logic, like Minecraft. Whether creative, survival, hardcore, park hour, skyblock, UHC, anarchy, you name it, Minecraft offers a wealth of variation on its core that can seem limitless. One thing I'd like to say about the game is that no matter how much thought, effort, heart or soul, no matter how silly and trivial or advanced and complex your ability to engage is, Minecraft can rise or lower to meet you. It is after all a sandbox that once engaged with always becomes a kind of reflection of the user. What you put in is what you get out, almost literally here. The game in some ways does massive amounts of heavy lifting for you, and in others, it's exclusively your effort, thought, imagination and agency that are the experience and requires you to do all the work to put them in. I want to start things off with diegesis. I apologise ahead of time to any literature or critical theory experts out there who might tear their hair out over the following section, but just know the explanations and definitions I'm setting up are for the purpose of my discussion in this video, and I'm putting in this dis disclaimer to say that I am by no means an inscrutable expert in any way. It's not like I'm a professor of literature or something. I'm just a guy who's thought a lot about it, and I would be thrilled to stimulate other points of view and make this a real discussion. So, cracking on. In university, I learnt that something that is diegetic is something that is within the world of the narrative, whereas something that is extra diegetic is external to that world. When it comes to good old books, an easy example is the actual text, punctuation, paper and ink that you read. They are extra diegetic parts of the story. Sure, they probably aren't what you think of when you talk about a given book or story, but if you held a book in your hand and pointed at it and said, this is the story, war and peace, nobody is going to scoff and say, no, that's just all the external pieces of medium through which the story, war and peace is conveyed. So, moving on from there, when something is diegetic, it might not be the actual paragraph you read, 
but the thoughts, emotions, internal world, the actual substance of the dialogue or descriptions you are reading. If Joe the noir detective in the story is mulling over what a dame like that is doing with a mug like him, that's a diegetic part of that noir story. Sure, they are just thoughts in Joe's head and nobody but reader and character are privy to them, but they actually exist from within the narrative world Joe inhabits, whereas the ink printed on the page that you have to read in order to come to know that Joe the noir detective has issues with ladies in red dresses does not exist within Joe's narrative world at all, but is still an essential part of the story in our world. So essentially, that you can absolutely hold it up, point to it and say, this is the story. It may sound like a bit of a silly distinction, but it is important to have technical jargon like that when, when writing about writing or employing literary criticism. When it comes to video games, these terms are somehow both more clear cut and more muddied. Video games are a vastly different media from any that have come before and are very different from the books I first le learnt this jargon in relation to. In a video game, a noir detective would probably still think that the dame in the red dress shouldn't be in his office, as diegetically as ever, but how it's conveyed to us, the player rather than the reader, could be a very clear cut, extra diegetic technique like a regular pop-up text box or something more tricky altogether. For example, it could be a simple voice line, maybe given a bit of reverb so you know it's a thought and not dialogue or voiceover displaced in time. That line of dialogue spoken by an actor is still diegetic. Well, at least if you buy the abstraction that we can hear the voice in his head and that his thoughts sound like his voice. It would be the reading out loud, the acting, the actor's coaching and recording process, the directorial vision and production elements like the reverb that would be extra diegetic. But this example could apply to a movie as much as a game. As an aside, I'd like to note that some research I did indicates that film people apparently call any sound not originating from an on-screen source non-diegetic. I'll let them puzzle over whether my example of narrated thoughts is from an on-screen source, as I'm not here to talk about film. Now, to give an example where video games substantially differentiate themselves from other media. Joe the noir detective thinks to himself that this is the fifth woman in a red dress this week. And where do they keep coming from? Is there a despondent woman in a red dresses factory right down the road or something? Maybe I should rename my agency. This time around though, it's conveyed to you in a way only video games can, through gameplay and interactivity. There's a whole level, say, Psychonauts style, where you, the player, are platforming around in Joe's head, and his trivial thoughts about dames and red dresses are collected one word at a time, in hiding places around a cunning level full of pitfalls, bad guys, and jumping puzzles. It sounds like a ludicrous way to convey such a simple thing, and it is. But that's metafiction that games will often do, and not just Psychonauts. American McGee's Alice comes to mind as another example. In this case, the line between diegetic and extra diegetic is blurred, as in a game, the extra diegetic abstraction of Joe's internal world exists within the narrative of the game, even if no characters but Joe ever see it, and especially, like in Psychonauts say, if other characters do get to see it. Joe's characterization exists across modes. In other words, his diegetic characterization is the extra diegetic gameplay. The key difference with games and books, and why the use of the term is a little awkward, is that you are playing, not reading, and the mode of play is quite different and has different rules to storytelling. Of course, story has its role, as any six-year-old can tell you if you attempt to join them in a round of cops and robbers. Playing and telling a story are often intertwined. Okay, have you got that? I promise understanding this comes in handy for talking about Minecraft later. So, now, with diegetic and extra diegetic in mind, when I speak of diegesis, this refers to the actual real-time process at the intersection between your perception and the extra diegetic components of whatever media you are engaging in that creates the diegetic world that you love and adore. 
diegesis as I'm going to use it is the emergent property that you experience at the union between the diegetic and the extra diegetic that lets you enjoy a consistent narrative experience. There is a third level, hypodiegesis or metadiegesis, which is the classic play within a play like Hamlet. When the diegetic characters themselves tell you a story from within their own story, and there are even more types than that, but they are not relevant to my discussion today. I just thought I'd mention them. Diegesis is usually contrasted to mimesis. For anyone out there jumping up and down about their platonic definitions, diegesis is the recounting or telling of a story and features the full rich interweave of diegetic, extra diegetic and hyperdiegetic elements. Mimesis is the enactment or imitation of a story, such as in a play. Kind of like theatrical empathy, it lets you suspend your disbelief and feel and understand as the characters do, even when you very much aren't the character. In games, you often do both, sometimes alternating between one or the other, or often interwoven for a little of both, or fluctuating so fast from one to the other moment to moment. Who can tell the difference anyway? Think of the kids playing cops and robbers again. You can be the cop or the robber, but the game may pause and abruptly redefine roles at the whim of the children, and whatever scant story elements they are indulging simply reshuffle around to accommodate. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to leave Mimesis alone and exclusively talk about diegesis. I'll even lay the challenge down if someone out there wants to make their own Mimesis of Minecraft video and contribute to the dialogue, that would be an absolute delight. It has been recommended to me by a teacher friend of mine that I try and use something visual to explain. So I'm going to have a crack here on Microsoft Whiteboard on my laptop in a bit of a lo-fi way. So we've got a rectangle and we've split it in half so we have a landscape with a horizon. The top portion of the rectangle, think of like the sky, so it's going to get a blue colour. And the bottom portion of the rectangle, I want you to think of like the ground with grass on top of it. So I'm going to give it a green colour. We're going to put a label up top. And can you guess what it is? Yeah, it's extra diegetic. Extra diegetic. And as for down the bottom, that will be diegetic. Tick. Diegetic. Excuse my crappy handwriting. I am by no means used to working with tablet, PCs, and pen. Now we get a circle and we put it in the middle so it looks a bit like the Australian Aboriginal flag. I want you to think of that circle as you with your feet on the ground and your head up in the sky. By breathing in the atmosphere of the extra diegetic elements of a given story, and then with support under your feet from the diegetic elements, you are able to put it all together and perform diegesis. I hope that helps you to understand the key terms. The next bit is kind of an aside, as I'm not going to go into it for the rest of the video, but I've already mentioned it and it might help to spur some of your own ideas. So you can add another rectangle on the bottom and you can color it, let's say red, because I don't appear to have brown here and that's to represent the dirt underneath the ground. We are going to write metadiegetic on it. If you are up there in the circle on the grass of the diegetic, breathing in the air of the extra diegetic, you can still experience the metadiegetic, but not directly. Only through the layer of the diegetic do you ever get to encounter it. Say you are reading Hamlet and you get to the play within the play. It is only through the diegetic character's dialogue and actions and overall the layer that they exist in that you get to experience that play. The play is only available if you read it through them in the same way that the dirt is only available to you if you go through the grass. Hence why no boundary is shared in my visualization between you performing the diegesis and the metadiegetic content under the diegetic ground. 
to finally get to the point and bring it all back around to Minecraft. To me, the single most fascinating and enticing thing about Minecraft is the way it goes about its diegesis. Now, I know a lot of you are probably crying out, but Minecraft doesn't even have a story. All you do is play Legos on the internet. And while I'm sure an equal number of you are now jumping up and down about the lore and story elements that do exist in the game, it's actually this free Lego-like play that is one of the things that is so captivating. And we will get into where it runs into those lore and story elements. Please, let's set them aside for a moment until we get up to them. So let's start with the most basic. We start a new game, we spawn in, and before we even get to the old punch a tree maneuver, let's presume we know nothing about the game for a second, and instead we just do your typical first time playing a game things. We move about, we test our controls and have a look around. Nothing too special yet. The world has a consistent look and vibe to it, the famous retro pixel block game motif. But in the first few minutes, the scope of all that won't have hit you, so we don't think it's that special. In the name of fiddling with the controls, you hold down left click and get yourself a block of dirt. You right click and place it back down. Maybe it doesn't click for your average player quite yet, but this is where I want to pause and point out how basically everything about the diegesis of Minecraft flows from this minute but also massive point. To move the block is to fundamentally change the game world, and by extension, the story and the lore. By that I don't mean the story and the lore of the greater game Minecraft, but of your particular game session, server or world file. This makes less sense with the single block of dirt than it does so obviously as when building a house or a shipwreck or an empire but let us first behold the mechanism at its most fundamental before moving on to that juicy goodness. Minecraft is not the first sandbox game. I think of the already mentioned Gary's Mod as an excellent point of comparison, although there were many before Gary's Mod. Minecraft also reminds me a bit of an overly granular map editor, like one that would come with Warcraft 2 or Heroes of Might and Magic, but if you are actually a little avatar flying around in it instead of hovering above with the more godlike point of view as we are used to in editors. One of the great hooks about Minecraft is that it essentially has taken the creative free form playful joy of creating in a sophisticated suite of editing tools and gamified it into a sandbox that can be played with rules or without. If I had to pitch it as a new concept in 2009, I might have pitched it as Photoshop meets Gary's Mod in a three-dimensional grid. The ingenious thing here is that the menus and tools and methods you use to edit have been dressed up in an internal logic and wonder that no longer are they esoteric because they are complicated and dense like in Photoshop, but because they are integrated diegetic parts of the game world. Now you may be saying to me, hang on there old shoebrief old pal, I get that the moving of the blocks has got an explanation within the game, but the menus? Well, here's the argument as I see it. The menus are an abstraction of your character's diegetic in-game actions. The crafting menu is an abstraction of you, for example, hewing some sticks and wood into a shovel. The inventory you, is you shuffling around what you have on you so you can use it and so on. Even the book that gives you recipes is an abstraction of your player's knowledge. Sure, if you equate the Minecraft player to a realistic person, this doesn't make a lick of sense, carrying around 64 stacks of meter by meter cubes. But now getting to the actual heart and soul of my point with everything Minecraft is that it no point does Minecraft follow any set of rules or logic, but its own internally established logic. And as a result, so does the diegesis. There is no pretense to realism here. No pretense that the world setting narrative or basically anything in the game at all has any verisimilitude. The game basically froths with diegesis, but only because it throws out reality entirely in favour of creating its own that follows its own set of rules and physics that completely and utterly excludes realism and verisimilitude altogether. If you create a world and see some cool floating island, you don't reject it as absurd and immersion breaking, you roll with it and imagine building a fantasy castle on it. This is the greatest strength of Minecraft, 
I think the developers, both before Microsoft's acquisition and afterwards, and even the general public who don't even play the game, are also entirely aware of this. As for the developers, their powerful understanding of exactly this through line is the strongest cohesive force across the game. It doesn't matter if you pick content from the early alpha days or from the latest update or anywhere in between. No matter what it is, whether music, sound file, texture, block, mechanic, all of it privileges Minecraft's bizarre inner cohesion above all else. Whether it's the crunch when you pick up sand, the way the pig grunts, your footsteps on basalt, the bubble columns, the way the music just lulls in there sometimes, the way you skid on ice in a boat, the nesting shulker chests, ender chests, the elytra wings and the firework rockets, the weird things that lightning can do to mobs, or heck, even the fact you can just boot up creative and play a purely flat game world with a bunch of content made inaccessible, none of it, not a scrap, deviates. There's no abrupt change in direction to capture a new market, like Minecraft needs to given the way it sells, there's no shift in tone or scale or an attempt to introduce an explicit story or anything other than an absolute religious commitment to the vibe. The origins of this logic, of course, go right back to the early days of development. And of course, most of the stuff that laid the groundwork were solutions, compromises that come from a single dev or very small team, creating something and solving problems with what they have and what they can do. The iconic music is so generously spaced is utilizing a friend's work for the game and then just having it only play sometimes so it goes further before it gets boring. The sounds like the pig grunt or sheep bar or the models like the iconic creeper design are relatively ad hoc low effort things as far as 3D modeling or sound design are concerned. The punching of the trees only makes sense in a game where progression matters more than realism or simulation or anything else. It's all accessible solutions for a tiny project that when all taken together, makes something much, much greater than the sum of its parts, the vibe and the diegesis of Minecraft. And I'm not trying to say that since the early days, these things haven't had heaps of sophisticated work put into them. Just that in the very early days, the basic vibe was set under those parameters. The success Minecraft saw back then was explosive, and the devs, whether pre or post Minecraft, knew to hold the vibe that the cohesion of all these elements produced sacrosanct. So much so that the sound design, for example, is now both brilliant in its distinctiveness and effectiveness, but also deceptively simple. The music, the graphics, everything may now masquerade as if it is a small, retro pixel, pixel indie effort but clearly one step behind the scenes, and this stuff is big budget, large team, high production value, lofty vision stuff. It's as if a billion dollar movie studio production was dedicating its time to perfectly delivering on an authentically primary school level home movie. Well, when I consider the wonderful Lego movies, we do actually live in a world where this kind of thing is far from alien from us. To prove this, let's look at some of Minecraft's update history. I don't have time to go through absolutely everything, so I will first tell you about my history and my memories of the early days of the game, and then after I will talk about some of the more recent updates I've been there to see, and how they relate in a technical sense to my point. I want to note that as I, I recount my memories of the early days, I know I'm probably not getting some things right in regards to the exact timeline of alpha, beta, inf, dev, and stuff, but I'd rather tell my personal story on burdened with version numbers, as I didn't record any of it at the time and wouldn't be able to prove specifically which version was when until we get to more recent updates. I know I bought the game as soon as it was available to purchase for about $20 AUD. I think with a promise from Mojang that all future updates, versions and variations would be made available to me for free. Given that Microsoft recently gave me Bedrock, Bedrock Edition because I already own Java, this has actually been a promise Mojang has delivered on, even in 2022. So, so that makes it probably the best $20 I have ever spent in my life. Like many older players involved with Minecraft, I first encountered the game in 2009. At the time, it was blowing up as a bit of a meme around the internet as a hot new game. No points to those of you out there who know exactly which notorious dark corner of the net I first saw it on. Back then, it was a very lightweight 
basic Java applet you could just play in the browser, and it only featured a creative mode. It was not the game you see today in any way, and only those bare bones basic features of the Vibe were there. But boy were they there. Back then we had a small server that me and my friends used to share whose PC it was being locally hosted on. We had a shared map that was very much not infinite in size, and we had a ball building all kinds of stuff. We used to even have a video on the old, of the old server up on YouTube for a long time, and I'd love to show you the footage, but I can't for the life of me find it. Probably my old mate who had the video uploaded to his account back then deleted it, or it just didn't survive the myriad upgrades to the YouTube platform we've seen over the better part of a decade and a half. I certainly have great memories of that time, I built a missile truck that had launched a missile with smoke with a smoke trail across the map and was heading toward a golf hole with a flag. There was a corner that was all snow and it had a huge ice wall, a la A Song of Ice and Fire, because a buddy of mine was reading it, reading it at the time. Another buddy built a castle and there was a pixel art of a Game Boy and a giant sword in the stone. The vibe was here, but it was definitely a proto-vibe, the Cro-Magnon of Minecraft. And when we ran out of space to build, as the gameplay worlds were very limited back then, we sort of got bored with it and moved on. Next came an update that added in zombies and skeletons and survival elements. It was so bare-boned <laughs> at the time that it failed to land with us. We could see the potential, but we probably only messed with it for a few hours at most, and then we left the game for a while at that point. Until that update came along that really began to nail Minecraft down into the game we all know and love. This time my friend hosted the server on his PC and this time we experienced all the mechanics that really established the game for what it is now. Punching the tree, crafting the pickaxe, the mobs at night, dying a whole bunch, building shelter, getting coal, making torches and lighting everything up, all that stuff. We had a server where we built ourselves a little base inside a hill, and I made a castle-like building next to it with a glass roof, blocks spaced apart with water running between the trees growing inside, a safe place to grow and harvest as much wood as we wanted. And right there is where the games really first sunk its hook deep into me, and I really experienced this concept of diegesis with it for the first time. I even put a sign on it and called it the Atrium, probably in a nod to Bioshock. The fact I felt the need to do that at all speaks volumes. My atrium was the first real time I built something motivated by the very meaning the game created, and not from the meaning I bought in from the outside. For me it was the first moment I was playing Minecraft as we understand it today, and not just digital Legos. The missile truck was cool to look at, sure, but it served no purpose and it had no meaning. The atrium was not a great build and a complete joke compared to what people build these days, that's for sure. And even though I didn't have a great grasp of the mechanics behind how trees worked at the time, I thought they needed flowing water nearby, or at least that would make them grow faster or something. Nevertheless, I built something that addressed the actual diegetic world of the game my character had been presented. See, you always needed more wood. Gathering wood in dark, naturally generated forests could be dangerous as this was before stacked armor and weapons and things like that. So I built a building that both made wood a safe renewable resource for us to gather and looked aesthetically like a building that could exist within the world of the game without anyone thinking twice about it. To this day, you have to try pretty hard before even the most absurd, abstract or stupid builds in Minecraft don't settle into the world and fail to bear that universally understood Minecraft aesthetic. We still managed to get bored with that server pretty quick. But a little later down the track, once a few more updates had come along, I believe around the point that the multiplayer survival worlds became infinite themselves, we started a new one. To be technical, I think to this day, Minecraft worlds aren't actually infinite, in that they do have world borders millions upon millions of blocks out from the center. I believe every Minecraft world generated is about seven times the Earth's surface making them so large as to be infinite enough in a practical gameplay sense. The point being that this time around, I was able to pack up and leave my friends and explore on my own and go and stake out a piece of the world of my own, well away from the city my mates were building at the world spawn. The world spawn was such a convenient place to build 
as if you died even if something had happened to the bed you usually respawn at, you would be back at the city with resources and friends on hand. By exploring further and building elsewhere, I got to experience several thrills that to this day have never gotten old. The thrill of discovering new lands and geographies and caves that nobody has ever seen before and dreaming of what you could build. The thrill of having the stakes raised so that if you did lose your respawn point, you'd have to navigate back, navigate back by yourself. And that's building in a way to address this. And I feel like that particular thrill is brought on even more by the concept of hardcore Minecraft. And finally, the thrill of setting up something everyone else just can't necessarily find and keep an eye on. The ability to just operate in secret and while anyone could just travel over and come across your base, the sheer size of the world and the small amount of players we, ha we had at the time made it rather unlikely. I found a lake I liked the look of by a forest. I set up a small dirt hut and I began building a big tower shaped like a diamond right in the middle of the lake with lava running in channels behind glass on the sides of the tower lighting it up. It was the thrill and joy of building something for my friends to discover and marvel at. Like a good magic trick, if they saw how it's done, it loses something. But if they were to discover it for themselves, or have it revealed to them at the right time, it can induce wonder. I think anyone who watches 2B2T videos or plays on a similar anarchy server would understand the excitement in this. No good hiding and creating secrets if there isn't some risk in their discovery. On Anarchy Mode servers, your creations can be griefed without moderator retribution, so the risk makes it very exciting. My lake tower base was the beginning of a fascination that I still have today. Lighting using lava behind glass. Back then when torches were the only real lighting option, it seemed an obvious answer, particularly in verticality. A single source bucket of lava can go from the height limit to bedrock and light up everything around it. And it looks amazing. At that base, I also found myself doing my first ever proper survival caving. Prior to this, caving had little purpose but to look at the caves. We hadn't played the previous world long enough to really go caving properly. This time around, I needed to cave to keep getting iron and coal and diamonds. As a result, I found myself getting lost in the caves. So in order to make the cave system understandable, I began to bring enough wood with me to make signs and doors. I would use cobblestone to wall off parts of them, and I would name branches I'd walled off and landmarks with the signs. I'd done some spelunking in real life, and that's how they navigated the caves I'd been in. There would be a great big hole named Sammy's Drop, or a crevice called Strawberry Squeeze, or a rock ledge called The Dripping Shelf, or similar. It worked a treat using this system, and I was able to, nav to navigate straight to any unexplored part of the cave system and find my way back out no problem. It also contributed to the story of the world. If I had been working with other players, I could have said to one of them, go down Sammy's drop and pass the door to Strawberry Squeeze and you'll find a pool of lava there you can use to help me build my cool tower. Names create a sense of place, character and story, and just the very structure of the game had made me delve into that very fundamental narrative toolkit just to make sense of it. That dynamic is the very cool thing about Minecraft I'm trying to communicate to you, that no matter how you play in the worlds of the game, you find yourself performing actions of diegesis. The names of the bits of those caves may have started as an extra diegetic nickname in my brain, but they became diegetic landmarks and places, and even if they had later been destroyed or griefed, that too would have become a diegetic part of the story of the world. For the record, I don't still cave this way, although I do think it would be brilliant to do it. It's just that strip mining is such an effective technique that has made it pretty much purposeless. If I get lost exploring a cave now, it's doubtful I'll ever have to navigate back through the system in an efficient way if I've already lit it up behind me. All the resources usually come out of the methodically laid out, easy to understand strip mine. Resources that I find caving are more like bonuses. If I want to get a lot of a certain kind of resource, I just go to the appropriate Y level and start strip mining. So these days, Lost Me just digs my way out from wherever I am and navigates back overland using coordinates or a compass and a lodestone. Not that we didn't just dig our way back out in the early days as well, but strip mining wasn't really a thing yet, or at least 
I hadn't thought of it or encountered it, and I certainly didn't have a chart of which block was most common at which Y level, so being able to navigate my caves effectively really mattered. Eventually, my friends did come across my lake tower, and we built a railway connecting our bases. This was before ice or elytra, or even the nether had been introduced to the game. My friends did indeed marvel at my secret creation, and some of them thought it was so cool they showed their friends and relatives who, of course, not being massive nerds, didn't care. Uh, my friends had of course been busy themselves and built an entire city at Worldspawn with city walls and everything. One of them was even inspired by my, by my use of lava, and he built a kind of castle-like building with lava integrated into the walls. With the railroad established between us, we could even trade and assist each other. Our world was beginning to feel less like a game and more like a world with distinct places, people and a history clearly visible in our structures and the evidence of our actions. All before the nether or villages or redstone or the end or any of those hints at a greater history or lore to the setting had been introduced. The diegesis of Minecraft was there first and everybody already loved it. There was one last thing I explored at that base which I want to talk about and that is farming, and I don't mean wheat. The first mob farm I ever built was on the shore of that lake. A simple thing, just a big dark cave made out of dirt that washed the mobs into a bit of lava. This being prior to redstone, there were no hoppers to pick up items, so they just dropped into another water stream that washed them to a collection point. I will speak more about farming later, but this too began to get my mind whirring in terms of the story and diegesis of my world. That farm was the first time that I had overcome the scarcity of resources and materials of survival and found myself some abundance. Looking at my tower, tower in the middle of the lake, I began to envision a city lit up and powered by the lava. I began to see it at the bottom of the lake underneath the water. The lava started from a giant glass diamond on top of the tower that ran down through the glass on the diamond shaped tower through to the lake bed where all of the buildings and streets down under the water would be exclusively lit up and glowing with the stuff. The diamond would become the symbol of my city from the great lava giving diamond at the top of the tower to the tower itself to the shape of the lake itself. The point of the entire thing was to give my server a diamond city. I think Bioshock had rubbed off on me quite a lot, and I wanted to create my own rapture, as it were. A place guaranteed to have safety and abundance. I would dedicate an industrial district with mob farms for the abundance, and the lava lighting plus underwater part would ensure that no mobs could spawn anywhere except in my farms, where players could be safe from them. This being before underwater mobs like Drowned had been introduced. I never did finish building my envisioned underwater lava city. Although, maybe one day I will. But it was the grand vision of the thing, and how the actual circumstances and challenges and solutions of the game world as it existed at that time dictated the vision that I wanted to get across. I felt like some ancient human, having the clouds parted and my own block game-centric version of Shangri-La shot into my brain. Me and my friends that I play with currently still joke about the dreams and how when you are in a certain place with Minecraft, you go to sleep and wake up with block-based plans rattling through your mind. To continue, some time around this point, the nether was first introduced into the game. And I remember we built a few portals and got blown up by some ghasts, but not long after that, we stopped playing altogether for a long time. And I mean a really long time. I would never play Minecraft again with that particular group of friends, and it would be the last time I would play on a server hosted locally on someone's computer. Many years later, I would be living in Sydney and craving a game where my actions had some permanence and that I could drop or come back to at any time with no real consequences. A game where I wasn't just playing out a sequence prepared for me to enjoy, nor building or tinkering just to serve some exclusively in-game purpose, like I'd been with Fallout 4 at the time. As an aside, I'd like to note, I think I have a substantial video on Fallout 4 and its mods in me, just saying so you don't get the impression that I'm trying to trash on it in any way. 
I was, and actually still am at the time of writing this, living in a large art collective with between six to nine other people depending on the year, and decided that Minecraft would scratch my itch and be a fun thing for the other nerds in my collective to all contribute to. A few years with my housemates just building a little here and a little there, and we might have a world with lots of very cool things in it. I found a company that hosted locally in Sydney, and seeing that a year's worth of hosting was actually quite affordable, I bought it on the 27th of October 2018. I then played very, very little until well over a year later. I would estimate maybe around January 2020, a few months after the Buzzy Bees update, but before the Nether update. No coincidence or surprise that this would coincide with the first part of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is where we move into the second part of my experience with the game, and where I hope to really hammer home my point in regards to how the devs have prioritised Minecraft's idiosyncratic inner cohesion as sacred above all else. I can't say for sure when I stopped playing before returning to the game, but my best guess would be around 2010 or 2011, which would put my break from the game at almost 10 years. Boy, did a lot change in that time. When I stopped playing, I remember thinking the game still had so much potential. I thought they'd add heaps of items for decor or furniture or player outfits and such. Stuff that made it easier for people to build and roleplay in a Sims-esque kind of way. I was way, 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 way off on those predictions. Instead, the devs looked inwards and vowed to add new systems that didn't dress up the game as it was, but instead served to deepen and expand the entire notion of the gameplay and what you could do with it all together. For an example outside of the updates I personally experienced, but I can't not mention, is the banner system. A rather simple example, but back in 2010, I wouldn't have been surprised to see them add in something like the banners we got sometime during the, the decade I wasn't playing, but I would have expected them to just give you a handful, to, a handful of existing in-game options and allow you to add custom ones extraneously, like the skin system or data packs. Instead, we got a full-blown in-game diegetic system that lets you customize and create banners using the loom block that has a that has i have heard something like 23 quadrillion combinations available to you and it is a diegetic system you actually have to build a loom get wool and dyes and design a pattern the creativity and ability to create banners this way that both make sense look great and are completely integrated into the game is just so on point, it's perfect. I personally have never been much good at this, but I have seen what others have, accom have accomplished, and it reminds me of the entire mechanic at the center of Minecraft. Instead of presenting you with a building system with menus where you pick pre-made parts like in Fallout 4, you get to actually fundamentally shift around the blocks in the grid, allowing for an infinity of combinations and structures and infinite customization. To put it another way, you don't just place other people's paintings and make an art show. You actually get to paint all of them for yourself, even if you are just copying someone off YouTube. The banners are similar, a near infinity of patterns from simple building blocks that you then get to integrate into your world. You can give them names on the anvil and then use them to mark and name places on the maps you make. You can use them to create yourself a kingdom or an empire or similar and make it your symbol, your flag. People have found plenty of novel and creative ways to use them just to make buildings look good, and I don't mean as banners. For example, I saw someone using them to make the upright red plush backing portion of a set of diner chairs at a diner booth on Reddit the other day. When Minecraft introduces a feature, it doesn't just introduce an idea for you to play with, it goes out of its way to make sure it integrates with the other systems in the game in a way where infin infinities of creative possibilities are unlocked. This systemic integration is one of the greatest keys to that inner cohesion, that vibe. I reckon they may even have a dev bible that forbids them from ever introducing features that don't integrate in some kind of intrasystemic way. Before I move on to the more recent updates as I experience them and discuss them in relation to my point, I'd like to just quickly note that this video is very much about my experiences with the game looking back. 
I realize there has been a lot of controversy and strong feelings around the most recent and upcoming updates. And while perfectly valid and interesting things to discuss, they just simply aren't in the scope of this particular video. Though if I inspire any discussion or comments on this front, I think it would be very welcome. So feel free to go ham on any of that lot in the comments. I'm just not going to discuss them right now. Beyond saying, of course, I do disagree with banning people from their private servers for chat violations. In my decade-long absence from the game, it had since evolved into something that had burst the seams of the dam wall of the original Java applet and flooded the valleys of the internet in greater popular consciousness. It had long ceased to be something you could just open up in a browser and start playing. Now it had a launcher, and there was an entirely separate Windows version of the game with RTX lighting, as well as spin-off games like Minecraft Story Mode, and at the time Minecraft Dungeons was around the corner. At the time of writing, Minecraft Legends has just been announced. I believe there is a theatrical film in the works, it has festivals and cons dedicated to it, there's an educational edition, Steve slash Alex is in Super Smash Bros on the Nintendo Switch, and I have to mention of course, it is the single best selling game of all time, and probably one of the most played of all time as well. I haven't played any of the other games, I've only ever played Java Edition, but I won't rule out giving them a go in the future. I just want to reiterate that everything I'm talking about is exclusively in reference to my experiences with the Java Edition. Since I'd last played, Minecraft had truly emerged from its cocoon-like early stages and become a billions of dollars strong butterfly, one that probably has jagged block-like wings. While Minecraft had always had much popularity on platforms like YouTube and wikis, now it had an almost symbiosis with them. In December of 2021, it was announced that Minecraft had hit over a trillion views on the YouTube platform, making it the most viewed game on YouTube. The thing about Minecraft is that the knowledge required to be able to play it and understand it properly is almost never acquired solely from within the game itself. I mean, sure, someone had to have discovered whatever particular thing you've seen on YouTube or read on a wiki or a forum or something first, but just as often as this is born from experimentation within the game, it is also born from understanding the extra diegetic aspects of the game, like looking at update notes or exploring the back end of the game and building on what other players have presented outside the game on those aforementioned platforms. When I first dived back into the game, this was how I began to get a handle on all that had changed since I had been away, through YouTubers making guides like Waddles, Mumbo Jumbo, and the incomparable Etho. I learned about all the features I had missed and how they worked. The footage you are watching now was recorded on the 24th of June 2020, and is of that world I made living in the Sydney Art Collective, where I mostly just implemented and practiced ideas I had come across in such videos. More to get a feel for what you can actually do, and how it all fits together now than to be building particularly wow factor or original or detailed builds. Though one thing I have learnt is sometimes a lot of functional builds in a dense concentration can often be just as impressive as an individual mega build. I considered this work, world and base to be more of a learning experience than a great project like I see so many other players showing off on the internet, and I'm not really sure I'm anywhere near close to getting out of this stage myself. I'm not the only one, and that the meta of Minecraft is vast and diverse and would require a lifetime to fully explore, and the game at no point in its history has ever really been contained by its own executable or software bounds, but has always spilled over and glugged into the heads of everyone who looks up a tutorial, writes a wiki article, makes a mod or a plugin or a video or so on. The first update I experienced once I was playing again was the Nether update. And that's not to be confused with the update I mentioned earlier that added the nether. Rather, this is the update that was aimed at reworking the nether into a place with more depth of gameplay and systems that interact with the rest of the game. A pretty exciting update to be a part of, I have to say. And this is actually footage of me playing it for the first time. I'm checking out the nether to find all of our building in there had been replaced with the new updated nether, and I felt like it wasn't really such a bad thing. It was a cool opportunity to start again with all the new detail and systems. To begin with, 
I just wanted to talk about the new nether blocks the update introduced, like blackstone, basalt and soul soil. For each of these, the devs needed to consider the texture, the sounds when mined and placed or when stepped on, where and how you find them and in what context, what tools have what effects on them, how they could be processed into other blocks or if they could, and what they could be used for and how they look, feel and sit amongst the palette of other blocks available in the game. There is a huge level of context and meaning around even the simplest blocks in Minecraft that a Lego brick can't even dream of. Well, basalt is not often found in the overworld like it would be in real life. That's a funny sentence. Kind of presumes hell might be real in our world. Um, let's not go there right now, though. Look, it's clear the devs well understood that basalt needed to preserve its relationship with lava in order to be considered basalt at all, Minecraft or not. Hence the mechanic where lava that meets a space that is in top of soil, soul soil and adjacent to a piece of blue ice becomes basalt. While mechanically this is very rigid and specific when taken with the context that is the basalt columns that are very reminiscent of the lava columns you find throughout the nether, the suggestion that in the right conditions lava turns into basalt provides just enough context and meaning that basalt, rather than just regarded in-game as another block with just a different texture, actually bears some of the weight and meaning of actual basalt on planet Earth. Its primary use is building and naturally generating as terrain. And in both roles, this meaning comes into play. You don't just build with it because of how it looks, but also because of its properties as a type of stone with hardness and durability. For example, it doesn't burn, unlike, say, netherrack, another type of stone that does. If you build a house with timber columns versus basalt, Diegetically, you are producing a different kind of house with a different kind of meaning. Real life or Minecraft, a stone house and a wooden one mean different things, feel different and fundamentally tell different stories about the society and culture from which they are produced. Terrain that you stumble upon also feels different and tells a different geological story. If it is an igneous rock like basalt versus a sedimentary or metamorphic rock, for example, Soul soil, on the other hand, is less obviously a building block for things like houses. Not that that stops anyone, but it certainly doesn't feel as practical a choice. It probably gets used a lot more for, as the name suggests, soil. Soul soil has a whole lot more mechanical meaning and touches that translate into bits of lore that allow for diegesis. Well, more than basalt does. The already mentioned mechanic where it allows you to make basalt is one thing, but its relationship with the screaming ghost-like faces on the texture of soul sand, the way it can summon the wither, make blue soul fire, soul campfires or soul torches, and is only found in the nether. My favourite is the little particle effects of little screaming blue souls that escape when you run on it with the soul speed enchantments on your boots. All of that taken together narratively gives you the impression that somehow, in the order of this world, Souls that find themselves in the nether end up trapped and transformed and somehow become the grains of dirt and sand that make up the soil, and that there are greater implications for how the fundamental order of the cosmology of Minecraft plays out. It begs questions as to whose souls are they? What process do they go through to become soil? Do souls go elsewhere other than the nether? And do they end up with other fates? Who decides where they go and based on what criteria? How does magic like soul speed take advantage of this? And who figures that out? Why can they be used to complete the wither summoning ritual and so on and so forth? Minecraft doesn't ever explicitly ask you these questions. They are just the natural results of the devs' extraordinary attention to detail and dedication to the cohesiveness of the game. The extended material outside of the game may attempt to address some of these kind of questions, like Minecraft Story Mode or other supplementary material, and that's awesome. But it's outside of my point. Even if only the core Minecraft game existed, you would still get the impressions of these kind of things going on in the world as part of the diegetic narrative, even though there isn't a diegetic word of exposition about it in the game, nor an extra diegetic piece of code or mechanic. The diegesis of the whole experience stands even with just a simple new block. 
Moving on to the biomes and structures, something I hadn't touched on yet, but for me coming back to the game so late, I saw the game go from basically having a small handful of biomes and structures to having dozens of the things when I returned 10 years later. So it was very cool to actually be there for the update that diversified the nether biomes. I can't even begin to describe the way additions like the Crimson and Warped Forests, Piglin Bastions and Piglins themselves, Soul Sand Valleys with their bone remnants of larger creatures and so on, suggest narrative and demonstrate the care with which the devs seek to expand the lore of Minecraft without ever being so explicit as to break the delicate balance of the mystery of it all that invites such speculation and enables such narrative construction. These updates took the nether from a bit of a one-note riff on the concept of hell to a fascinating presentation of an entire other living world, with hints at completely different eras and epochs, where perhaps the cosmological order was different. There are ecosystems now with plants that evolved to deal with their circumstances, suggesting a very unhell like lack of a cosmological overseer dictating what is present. The fossilized remains of larger creatures and shattered remnants of piglin civilization, the ruined portals, the entire valleys of soul sand and soil, they all suggest huge world-changing events in the ancient past of the Minecraft world, and their mystery allows you as a player to build and create and to synthesize your own answers and narratives, which don't necessarily have to synergize with all the little hooks and suggestions the game is presenting to you, but it sure does get our storytelling brain moving. Why are the piglins obsessed with gold? Why is there so much gold and quartz in the nether? What's with the entire porcine or evolutionary tree from hoglins to piglins to zombie piglins to regular pigs? How do they all relate? What is their culture, their hierarchies and society? And not from extra diegetic mechanical gameplay points of view either, as we have answers for those questions and kudos to the devs for being so thoughtful about it. It's the diegetic search for the reasons in-game and the fact that they aren't answered that is so compelling. If there were lore books lying around, like in the Elder Scrolls titles, explaining things for you and presenting the myths and legends diegetically from within the world of the game, sure it might be compelling to search them down and maybe build some historical reconstructions of their structures, but this way, isn't it so much more compelling to be some agent Aeons down the track, putting it all together in your own head, free to have whatever you construct or decide in your world be the truth, whether it addresses the mystery or not. Mojang's great trick here is not to answer questions, but to ask them with their content. It's to introduce elements that beg you to connect dots and make your own answers, to create fertile soil with which you can plant your seeds of creativity and cultivate them, care for them and make them grow because of the sheer granular level of the terrain deformation and building that the one by one by one removal and placement in the 3D grid allows for, what you end up growing to answer those questions can be spectacular and detailed on a level that has never really been seen before in video gaming and is rarely seen in all of computing and heck, even the greater world of art and creativity. Not that sophisticated tools aren't used to build, say, for example, complex cityscapes and worlds for other games or movies, for example, or that architects and artists in the real world don't render their projects in software and then proceed to build them for the real here, for, for real here on planet Earth. But when these things are done, they're done with much more limited boundaries. For movies and games, you only create exactly what you need to pull off the project. Movies only render just enough to trick you into believing it is real for the scene. A game like GTA V or Cyberpunk 2077 might have a whole simulcrum of a city living and breathing for you to run amok in, but they are minuscule copies next to the real thing, with just enough going on to give you an impression of a city to immerse yourself in rather than in any way being an actual city. Architects may plan, devise, and render actual buildings, but real cities involve millions of people, bureaucrats, tools, software, and so on, all doing their own thing. I'm not trying to say you get actual one-to-one cities out of Minecraft, bustling with people going about their lives, but given the team of nearly 2,000 people trying to build a realistic one-to-one copy of Australia as part of the Build the Earth project, I'll put a link in the comments, I can think of I can't think of any other software, let alone video game, where that is considered an achievable, realistic goal. Well, 
Aside from Google Maps, but advanced automated capture of what already exists is different from building from scratch. And while that team is trying to copy what exists, the point is you could build a fictional world of that level of detail and nuance, given enough time and people. It's kind of an infinite monkey's infinite typewriter's proposal. Although populating it with anything but the most basic and repetitive of AI entities is a bit beyond Minecraft's capacity. Well, at least yet anyway. With all those ideas we've just been through in mind, what I would like to talk about is more broadly the way the devs have handled the way the structure and biomes allow for this process of diegesis for the player to be so powerful. It's like they are providing just enough scaffolding for you to encounter to hang and construct your own ideas upon. They are acutely aware you are the nexus of meaning in your own world and that they, in providing the procedural world to you, can easily go too far and lock you out of your own ideas about what's going on in your particular setting. They provide for you enough cohesion in the visuals and sound, just enough hints at lore and narrative in the generated structures and mobs that you don't have a skeleton that suggests a shape or nature of a beast that then locks you into their vision for the game, but instead a scaffold, a starting point from which, from which you can gain access and have purchased to build anything at all. Well, unless you wanted to build something that doesn't look all pixelated and blocky, but all the heavy lifting in regards to that was done by video games of the 8-bit and 16-bit era that have already established a visual language that can communicate just about anything. Sci-fi, fantasy, cyberpunk, realistic, you name it. Even then, thanks to the flexibility of the engine and support and inclusion of data packs and mob packs, you can address this yourself quite easily. Imagine if the devs, rather than just have villagers as you know them spawn with their limited palette of structures and roles for the villagers, actually decided to introduce a villager city. I guess you would have to call them citizens instead of villagers then, but I'll still refer to them as villagers. Because of the procedural nature of the game, the city would have to have one of two possible natures. Option one is that this city is the same place in every world, just in a different spot. It is full of actual named characters and books and places with extensive lore and exposition to encounter. Instead of villagers making their distinctive hums and grunts, they actually speak extensively and intelligibly at length about their internal worlds and problems and motivations and how they relate and are influenced by the external world of the game. Probably even via a text box. The city has the same layout and structures, glorious and detailed and impressive every time. You know, like most cities in most open world RPGs. Apart from just generally being antithetical to everything we've ever seen Minecraft do so far, the reason it would be a detriment to the game is not just because it wouldn't be very procedural in nature, but because it would shut so many doors on the player's own agency, and as a result, their diegesis. The structures and characters would all have their own meanings and stories pinned down already, like butterflies in a Lepidopterus collection. That would then have implications for the rest of the characters and structures in the game, and it would remove so much of the player's ability to construct their own stories and worlds around the procedural content that does exist. Option two is that it remains much like the procedural basic villages now, but bigger. They generate with city walls, more buildings, a larger footprint, more jobs for the villagers and corresponding job blocks. Now there's a palace with royal villagers, a city council with bureaucrat villagers, coliseums with athlete villagers, defensive structures with soldier and guard villagers. I feel this would also do the game a great disservice and close a bunch of doors to the player to perform their own diegesis and be the nexus of their world, not quite so much as option one, but I still think it would do it nevertheless. If this villager city structure generated, it would remove the need for you and maybe your friends too to do all this for yourself. The raid mechanics as they exist would already be overcome by these generated cities. The devs, rather than expand the villages in terms of their impact on the narrative scaffold the world presents, stuck to their Bible on the Minecraft vibe instead and went for further integrating into, es into the esoteric 
procedural mechanics that can act as the motivation and basis for you to do it instead in your own way in your own time and with your own reasons maybe you want to optimize your village to farm the raids maybe you want to go full narrative and build elaborate walls and guard towers and town halls and have something that feels like a real city that could exist in your world maybe you want to make a cyberpunk city instead maybe you want to turn it into a horrifying death camp and so on if the devs expanded the village with my imaginary option too and started putting in walls for you they would shut some of the infinite possibilities down by already having such an elaborate suggestion and solution in place the path of least resistance becomes building on what they provide you by only providing you the barest of bones and suggestions in their procedural structures they allow for the largest plethora of possibilities and in turn enable your diegesis as you build the walls from whatever materials you have on hand or even have gone to enormous effort to collect you take your own extra diegetic desires and motivations and transform them through diegesis into a diegetic part of your world. You want to defend the village from the raids, so you erect walls from nearby oak trees and cobblestone you dug up. And now you have created a setting that the dramas and struggles of defending those timber and cobblestone walls can play out in. On the other hand, Maybe it's late game for you and you erect blinging walls out of gold, emerald and diamond blocks to communicate your power and wealth. If the developer just does it for you, they deprive you of the richness of infinities that performing that process can create. If you think that is a bit far-fetched, I suggest jumping on some of the Minecraft communities around the web, whether forums, subreddits, YouTube channels or servers, and take a look at how real people actually do this. You can find people who absolutely roleplay to this level of nuance. They use the banners, maps, name tags, anvils and books in the game to weave narrative structures they can roleplay in. They'll name all the buildings and geographic features, map them out and label them, chronicle the history of events in the in-game books, and create rich stories of their worlds. Because there is no definite line drawn by the devs around what does or doesn't count as a part of any given world, it becomes up to simple agreement by the players involved as to what actually counts as story or not story, as history or just gameplay, as diegetic or extra diegetic. Look at FitMC and his Timelines of the Anarchy server 2B2T's history. In his videos, the lore, narrative and history generated include meta components of the gaming culture around Minecraft into their diegesis. It is diegetic history in their world that a famous player named I Tristan hacked into the back end of the server and created godlike items that they call 32k items. Something that you would think fundamentally to be an extra diegetic action. If Minecraft were a book, that would be like driving to the author's house, opening up their manuscript and changing the description of the magic sword. Minecraft is fundamentally flexible enough a diegetic engine that it just lets whatever agreement, implicit or explicit, between the stakeholders in the world ride. And it is that process that I think allows for Minecraft's incredible diverse success. I call this ability for Minecraft to incorporate meta-elements into its storytelling paradiegesis. In the same way that your relationship with, say, a YouTube creator that you've never met is called a parasocial relationship. Incidentally, that's something I'm trying to cultivate with you right now. Paradiegesis isn't exclusive to Minecraft by any means. It is something that video games have done well for a long time, as long as I've played them. Whenever your gaming session between you and your mates becomes more than just a gaming session, when your deeds and actions in the game together become story and history and you codify it somehow, usually by something like a YouTube video, although it could be a blog or prose or an epic poem for all I care, or especially if it's your mates at the pub, just so long as it isn't lost to ephemeral memory. Minecraft is just particularly good at it. In fact, probably the single best entity so far for generating paradigmatic content. 
If people couldn't use Minecraft as this engine of narrative and create paradigmatic content with it, they wouldn't be able to make the trillion hours of content that people want to watch. They wouldn't be able to spin off so much merchandise and other game titles, and there wouldn't be big Minecraft YouTube stars with more followers than some TV channels get ratings. It is the paradigmatic of Minecraft that lets it be such a ridiculous zeitgeist, and our storytelling eight brands go nuts for it. Remember this? Just thought I'd attempt to visualize this new term, paradiegetic. It would be like a cloud in the extra diegetic sky that you in the circle can see and interact with, but not so directly. It is one layer removed, but has some transient gaseous like ability to exist across layers like a cloud raining meaning falling through the extra diegetic atmosphere and soaking down into the diegetic ground. When you watch a tutorial on YouTube, you pull meaning from that cloud and you disperse it through the other layers, enhancing your experience of diegesis. This doesn't just happen randomly. After all, Lego and Dungeons and Dragons are good examples of other kinds of granular, creative storytelling engines that while very successful, certainly aren't seeing the same level of trans-historical success that Minecraft is currently going through. I think there's fundamentally something about the level of simulation a computer allows you to immerse in that makes a key difference here. In Lego, you may build yourself a castle, but you cannot get into that castle and defend it. You need minifigs and a whole lot of imagination for that. In Dungeons and Dragons, you can defend your castle with your mates, but you can't build it and inhabit it. You can only represent it, whether with visual art, prose description, miniature models, or role-playing, or what have you. In Minecraft, with its simulation aspect, your castle doesn't represent another castle in your collective imaginations, nor do you need to use your imagination to get inside it and defend it. You just need some friends who want to lay siege to it. Or given the popularity of griefing, not even friends, just anybody in the multiplayer environment. Even in single player, you can defend it from mobs. And for lots of children, this is more than enough. In Minecraft, imagination is used to put the pieces together. You need to figure out what you're going to build and how you are going to build it what it's called and why it's called that, and what it's used for. But the simulation and the computer will do the rest. And it will persist happily in the simulation without your input once it is done. Now, I'm not saying that you couldn't represent something else in Minecraft. I'm sure lots of people have built castles out of, say, a Game of Thrones, also known as the Song of Ice and Fire, for example. But when people build Winterhold or King's Landing, they don't post it on the internet and pretend it is purely a representation of those fictional castles. They post it fully in the knowledge that it is, is as much Minecraft as it is George R. R. Martin. In fact, so much so that if you go look at such posts on the Minecraft subreddit, you will see that people usually use the format I built X in Minecraft, where the X is the Starship Enterprise, the Sydney Opera House, or King's Landing. The process of building something in Minecraft has its own set of challenges and creative problems that make any act of representation in it distinct from any other act of representation in any other medium or on any other platform. You can build anything in Minecraft. And when I say anything, I mean anything. The two limiting factors are usually just how much time do you have and in what scale. These two components are pretty much inseparable. Minecraft blocks theoretically represent something like a one meter by one meter by one meter cube, which really limits your ability to build things, say, smaller than a meter cubed without adjusting the scale. The scale will determine the amount of detail and hence the amount of time. For example, if you want to build a model coronavirus, you're going to have to scale that mother up significantly. If you're fine with it not being especially detailed, it might not take very long, but it won't be very spherical or very spiky. 
If you want that model to be detailed and accurate, it's going to have to be huge to get a decent sphere and spiky proteins. That will mean a lot of time, especially if you're doing it in survival and have to gather the materials first. Still, there is virtually no limit on how big the scale can be, and you will never have to scale anything down in detail unless you attempt to build one-to-one -one representations of cosmological entities that are bigger than seven times the Earth's surface, like Nebula or Jupiter or something. But the time barrier will have ruled that stuff like that out long before the world size barrier will. Theoretically, if time wasn't a factor, you could even build something that big by putting world files next to each other in a virtual kind of way. Then your only limit would be the storage space and memory on your hardware. Bringing it back down from the crazy theoretical again, detail and scale are fundamental questions any Minecrafter must ask themselves when attempting builds. And fundamentally, they are questions that result in you earning the most glory if you choose to build something that has a huge amount of depth, time, effort and detail, you also win the most praise. Despite this, many players, myself included, as well as the procedural structures from the devs, prefer to scale everything to their player representation in the game, so that everything feels like a naturalistic size for your player character. And this is optimal for diegesis, but isn't always possible for some builds. For me, I love for my builds to make sense for the scale of my avatar, but for some players, what they want to build just isn't possible that way. On Reddit, I've seen quite a few players building huge gothic cathedral-like structures from the Dark Souls series recently, and for those players, it just isn't possible to render the level of detail required for the spires and arches and filigree in the stained windows and have it genuinely scale well with Minecraft Steve and or Alex. Doorways and windows have to be many, many times the size they'd be on a real gothic cathedral in order to just have the room and blocks to pull it off. I haven't played any of From Software's games, but I gather those structures are in their own crazy unreal scale in the first place. But you understand what I mean. A lot of the most impressive builds you see on the internet are in absolutely enormous scales, and that makes a lot of sense if you think about the blocks as roughly equivalent to pixels on a screen that would make your player character a bit larger than two pixels, which would necessitate anything you are representing on that screen being huge in comparison. It's the ability to realize whatever you can imagine or desire, combined with the plethora of sophisticated ways to realize paradigesis that really sets Minecraft apart from other survival games. Why didn't InfiniMiner, the game Minecraft was heavily spun off from, take off like Minecraft did? What about Ace of Spades? It was like Minecraft meets a more typical shooter. Or more broadly across the open world survival genre, other big titles that are around today like No Man's Sky. Not that it isn't a popular or successful game or anything. I'm in no way here to diss on No Man's Sky. I haven't even played it, although one day I'd love to. It's just that when compared to Minecraft, there is no other game that is even really close in terms of not just sales, but in cultural impact. Look at GTA V, the next best selling game of all time, 73 million units behind Minecraft. Sure, it has huge cultural, cultural impact and reach of its own, but it ain't a trillion hours of YouTube launching young people into superstardom huge. Though, I'm sure it has many successful streamers, even if I can't name any. Minecraft is so ubiquitous among people under a certain age bracket that even with the tiny sample size like my workplace, if I meet someone 25 or younger, I can almost always guarantee they'll have played it in some capacity and be able to hold a conversation about it. Even if it was just a fleeting little thing for them, it's just part of their zeitgeist. Minecraft's bizarre internal logical mechanics make that paradigmatic effect so accessible for everyone, from children on their parents' tablets to hardcore gamers on that fat RGB rig. If you can imagine something, you can experience an epic story in the simulation of gathering the resources and building that thing, and then codify it and share it and have millions of others become a part of it without ever meeting them. And when I think about it like that, it is little wonder we have this medium that is more phenomena than just a game. 
It is the weird, esoteric knowledge that makes the Minecraft community tick and thrive. Whether the thrill of secretly building on an anarchy server, or the how to tame a horse password on South Park, or learning a new way to use a trapdoor for decor on a subreddit, or learning redstone or a new method of farming, it's this esoteric, arcane knowledge passed from player to player that truly marks the difference between someone who is good or bad at Minecraft. You can be legendary as a builder, a redstoner, a PVPer, or a historian and documenter, and many, many other things, but it is the intimate expert knowledge behind these Minecraft occupations that make those players good at what they do. And in the demonstration, sharing, and teaching of this knowledge, players become sage-like, wizardly even, and they become legendary and sought after, whether in the microbiome of just their world or server, or in the greater community and meta. Take farming. And as mentioned in brief earlier, in Minecraft there are two kinds of farming. One is the very diegetic act of hoeing some dirt near some water, planting something, waiting for it to grow, and then harvesting and repeating the cycle. This is the last time I will use the term farming to refer to that process because it's going to get real confusing fast because the second way to farm refers to essentially using the bizarre gamified logic and physics internal to Minecraft to, in some capacity, either fully or partially automated, generate items for yourself. It is confusing because you can essentially use the second kind of farming to go about the first kind Although Minecrafters out there will know the difference just from the contextual use of language. This kind of farming ranges fully from a completely diegetic thing to extra diegetic to the paradigmatic. There are people on YouTube right now who have basically made careers out of designing, sharing and making tutorials out of farms. If you are particularly across the weird quirks of the game and know how to exploit them to create farms, that, that is valuable. It is valuable only in the survival mode of the game, of course. In creative, you can just give yourself an infinite amount of any item. It's the scarcity that makes farming and the knowledge of it such a valuable and coveted thing. If you can package and transmit this information in an accessible and digestible tutorial, you can make money that way. Well, at least for the lucky few. What's so interesting to me about it is the actual progression through the game that farming is a part of. Not that you have to build farms to progress, you can absolutely do without them, or for some players other members of their server build the farms and their contributions or role bring something to the table that allows them to either be granted access to the items the farms generate or to trade for them. When I first started watching farming tutorials and building my own, it struck me how weird the whole thing was. It felt very much like what might be considered exploits in other games, but the developers, rather than clamp down on this and say, that's not how you play Minecraft, like with all things to do with this game, have done the complete opposite and said, that's absolutely how you play Minecraft if you want. Let's incorporate it into the game and add as much as we can to make it even more sophisticated and even more interesting. A lot of players out there will get this. You build an iron farm early in the game, which becomes the basis of an economy for you to build some more sophisticated farms in the mid game. As many of the components required for such things require a lot of iron. How do you build an iron farm? Well, you take advantage of villager mechanics. A certain amount of villagers within a certain distance of each other the game considers a village. If members of a village become frightened by a nearby hostile mob, they will spawn in a golem made of iron to defend themselves. So to build a farm, players build some chambers that when filled with villagers meet the barest of requirements for the game to fulfill the village definition, and they trap a hostile mob in a special chamber nearby so that for the rest of eternity in the game those villagers are in a constant state of alarm and are forever spawning iron golems. The iron golems similarly have a set of rules defining when and where they can't spawn. So players build the iron farm chambers in certain ways to take advantage of that and make sure that the golems only ever spawn in a structure that murders them via one of several methods available and collects their drops for the players to use. When considered through the lens of diegesis, you have the paradiegetic level of the meta-knowledge shared and tutorialized on the internet. 
the extra diegetic level of the actual gameplay mechanics that are being exploited by the player, and finally, the horrifying diegetic level that is the industrialized golem murder machine run on villager terror you've created for generating iron. In doing so, a player is then able to skip having to manually mine for iron, which, remember, is one of the most fundamentally useful resources in the game, therefore saving themselves both time and the resources needed to do the mining in the first place. Even a poorly designed iron farm, given a little time to run, will generate far more iron than most players can ever hope to mine in the equivalent amount of time. A well-designed one will generate an absolute immensity of iron that can liberate many players from the need to ever mine iron again. This is fascinating to me. I'm not sure if the devs have ever come out with an official word about how acceptable it is. Certainly if you go so far as to project a diegetic level of emotions, thoughts and feelings onto the villagers and golems, what you are doing is outright evil and in a stunningly apt comparison to actual industrial practices we've seen in the real world. If you want an even closer comparison for a Minecraft farm, look into automated chicken farms. In moral terms, there is some balance there. In order to get such plentiful resources, you must be undeniably evil and exploitative. Although I feel that few players, including myself, actually play in such a way that morality exists at all, it's a bit like ascribing morals and internal worlds to Lego minifigs when you play with them. Sure, you could especially just for long enough to tell a story, but ultimately they aren't alive in any way, shape or form, and they are only just barely reaching for enough representation that you can even pretend they are. The little iconic smiley Lego face doesn't make you pause and go, oh my god, I'm decapitating this poor guy, when you pull it off to swap the heads between two minifigs. And if it does, it usually inspires humour and not horror. In fact, they are explicitly made with that purpose in mind. Still, the golems carry poppies on them, a red flower for anyone not familiar. And in their natural village environment, they will offer them to villagers, and especially baby villagers, who gleefully accept them with easy to understand excitement and joy. And if you can understand their happiness, there's also room to understand their suffering. The thing is, in survival mode, if you wish to build genuinely massive and impressive structures, if you want to realise your imagination and not cheat, actually work and gather and create the resources to bring your Minecraft visions to life and not have it take literally years and years and years of mind-numbing grinding, then this kind of farming is absolutely necessary. You could just build in creative mode to do this, sure. But this is really the clever thing the devs have embraced about the whole farming thing. It's, it's that it's actually kind of hard to do, and it requires that specialist, esoteric, pa paradigmatic knowledge to do it at all. Now, lots of experienced Minecrafters will scoff at this point because iron farms are kind of basic and aren't that hard to build, really. There are certainly a plethora of farms more complicated, some of them with so much going on and requiring so much knowledge, it makes real-life engineering and industrial processes look appealing by comparison, or at least that's how I feel when I see some of the more ridiculous things that you can see on Il Mango's YouTube channel and the SciCraft server. In fact, it is sophisticated enough, it actually makes up an entire subgenre of Minecraft known as technical Minecraft. Back to the point, is that you show an iron farm to someone who hasn't delved into the meta or paradigmatic worlds of Minecraft and just plays block game the way it is presented to them entirely within the package you download and they will find it intimidating and very difficult. With my 10 years away from the game, figuring out an iron farm took me months. Months just to learn all the weird contextual knowledge that let me even understand what Nine Farm was and why it might be useful. And then when I understood enough to actually build one, I probably spent about a week in real life moving villages around on rails, accidentally killing my zombies and troubleshooting the thing before I got it to work. Of course, once I got it to work and liberated myself from one of the most boring grinds of the game, it felt amazing. And on my old server, at the time, none of my other friends had begun engaging with the game on that paradigmatic level yet, so it gave me a heck of an impressive edge and draw card for my base amongst them at the time. I also learned a bunch of basic concepts and components that would come in handy time and time again in other farms and builds. 
Of course now an iron farm is among the first things I build when I set up a new base, and it'll probably only take an afternoon. Stuff like access to a village and villagers and how I can transport them in order to be able to build one is something I would consider in the first place when choosing a location for a base. But that knowledge and experience was won the hard way and will never leave me. And that's such a powerful thing. I'm certain it's one of the reasons that many players keep on coming back and remain Minecraft addicts for life. The weird secret knowledge of how the game actually works and the fact that each time you master a little bit more of it, you unlock, you unlock entirely new layers to the game and liberate yourself from time consuming grinds that don't just allow you to pursue and realize your imagination, but actually expand the possibilities available to your imagination. How? Well, for example, prior to acquiring an iron farm, building with actual blocks made from iron would be a heinous, time-consuming waste. Once you have them, it opens them up as a completely viable and useful building block and allows you to consider their texture and where they sit in a gradient or palette of other blocks to create beautiful builds. By the time you get to the late game, and you end up with an item that lets you glide around known as the elytra, it definitely seems to me the most compelling argument that the devs are completely about encouraging and developing this aspect of the game. I wasn't around for when the item was first introduced, but I'm aware that initially, the only way to use it was to climb to a very tall place and leap off and glide around. Later, the devs introduced firework rockets, which you could use to shoot yourself through the air, effectively allowing you to fly under, the, under your own power, each rocket providing you a burst of acceleration, so long as you have the rockets. Rockets are made from combining gunpowder and paper, both of which are completely farmable items within the game. If you are also looking at the mapping features, brilliant in their diegetic incorporation into the game, no HUD exclusively visible to only you, the real person in this game, but actual maps your player avatar holds in their hands. The largest scale maps are really only viable to explore and reveal in conjunction with the elytra and rockets, and to do so you need lots of rockets. I think there is every intention that in order to you really use these items to their fullest and enjoy flight properly, the devs want you to build paper and gunpowder farms. After all, why the heck wouldn't they? It gives you motivation to utilise all sorts of blocks and features, from redstone items like observers and pistons and hoppers, to regular ones like trapdoors and gates. It gives you a reason to build stuff in your world, to add meaning to another place, to mould another section of the world into something for you. And that is what Minecraft is all about. The thing about farms is, even when you are copying someone else's design from the internet, there is so much freedom and scope to make it your own, for your own situation. Sure, the design is the same mechanically, but the choice of the building blocks that you can substitute, the adaptation of the terrain you are using, the way it is placed and oriented amongst the things you've already built, the whole look, vibe and presentation of the thing, and even your own understanding of it. It becomes your own. It's common for YouTubers to acknowledge when they're using a design someone else came up with, but often, Although not always, the end product looks completely different, even if it functions the same. Not to mention for users who scale up or down existing designs and thus have to address the, prob the problems that this then creates. Or users who adapt designs as just one of many complex intersecting components in a larger project. Some designs and methods are so common or so obvious in their intention by the developers, it'd be weird to think about them in terms of intellectual property and giving credit at all. In multiplayer servers, farms are powerful social creations that can be used, as mentioned in my own personal visions from the early days of the game earlier, to create abundance. Building truly gigantic farms can be considered massive server-defining achievements, and on many servers, having some players achieve some farms while others create some elsewhere makes trading a serious option and makes entirely social economies start thriving. Come to think of it, Minecraft is also fascinating in terms of gaming economies and their design. For developers, there is the concept of a tap and a sink. A tap is a thing that creates resources, like a faucet running water. It pours resources into the game's systems and mechanics. In a classic RTS, for example, it would be, say, a gold mine structure you click on and watch your dudes pick away at while your little gold counter goes up. A sink 
is where you use up those resources. So in our RTS example, you might build a barracks and buy some troops with your gold using it up, like the water running down the sink. For game developers building games for others to play, this can be a very useful way to play. But farms in Minecraft are an example where the players themselves have to go out into the world, or the paradigmatic level, use the knowledge there to then build their own taps in their Minecraft world. They don't just find them lying around with an arbitrary bottleneck like a tech they have to research or a unit they have to build before they can access it. The only thing preventing players from building a tap and wallowing in abundance or providing for their entire server or, or a faction on that server is their own knowledge, time, motivation and dedication in building any particular tap. The devs leave it up to the players to actually make them decide when or if they need them and how they're going to go about realizing them. The abundance a tap brings is the motivation with which the players needs to build them. And the thing is that building a tap can be a sink. For example, for me, I use more iron for building other farms than I do for anything else. And in order to build the farms I want to build in the scale I want to build them, I must first build an iron farm or iron tap, as it were. So my iron tap's main sink is building other taps, although iron has many other sinks in this game too. Say paper and gunpowder, which have many other sinks as well, but to call back to the farms I used in my elytra example given earlier, my main sink for those farms is the rockets I use flying about the world. I use rockets at a rate below that which my farms produce gunpowder and paper, well, then I have an abundance. When you think about this in conjunction with multiplayer, especially for larger servers that don't either A, have hugely altered third-party modded economies, or B, are grief-happy anarchist, anarchist wastelands, you know, you know, large, mostly vanilla-ish SMP servers, the economy has been left by the devs mostly for the players to handle. The abundance, distribution in, and inflation of resources is dependent on how well the players construct their taps and how they choose to use, share, trade and control them. Not that the devs let players go completely gung-ho with absolutely everything in the game. As mentioned, many of the items that are farmable in the game have many sinks and many systems they are useful for. Not to mention the fundamental concept of building, which is an ever-present sink that never goes away and a surefire way to use up a ridiculous abundance. Got 200 chests full of iron blocks from your way oversized iron farm? Build an enormous pyramid beacon and use all, all of them up. It's practically a rite of passage. The devs also bring balance by making sure not everything in the game is farmable, making items that are especially useful but not farmable retain huge amounts of value. Theoretically, some things in Minecraft are even finite, although given the immense size of the world that procedurally generates, it's often only a theoretical finiteness. Although very large and popular servers I'm sure do have to contend with this, given third-party plugins and mods I'm sure it's not much of a problem for them. In a similar fashion, Balance can also be found by the sheer difficulty of building some farms, making them inaccessible to all but the most knowledgeable, dedicated, motivated and patient of players. Of course this means if you do have the knowledge and skills to build one of the difficult farms and you are in a thriving multiplayer economy, you will have a lot of leverage in terms of trading and also access to the most impressive materials to construct the most impressive builds. I think there's quite a few games out there these days that utilize player-made taps that feed into player-made sinks that are taps themselves that then feed into sinks and so on and so forth. It has basically become a genre of gameplay. The example I think of is Factorio. I don't think Minecraft is so about this that you could call it a part of that genre, but it is undeniable that it is a major draw card and occupation for many players. It presents such a powerful way to create progression, evolution, and emergent meta-defining gameplay. It isn't the only way to play the game, of course. Minecraft is such a flexible platform. It is, for me, the most synergistic with the most diegesis found in the SMP game mode. And the creative realization by players of major pieces of economic infrastructure for their servers introduces narrative meaning, emergent behaviors, possibilities, and consequences that don't exist otherwise. And that is ingenious design. 
The farms don't just regulate your S&P gameplay in economic terms either, but also in spatial terms. While some farms can just be built anywhere, many of them require a specific spot, chunk or structure that generated when your world did. This means that you either had to know you wanted to build that farm and create your base near it with that purpose in mind, or that you have to go out into the world and find the location for your farm. The devs, when adding all kinds of features, consider the motivating factor it might have in getting players to get out and explore the world. After all, you don't spend a decade plus developing breathtaking, enormous procedurally generated worlds to not give players any reason to explore them. The farming reason is, for me and I'm sure a great many other players, one of the most seductive and enticing reasons. Often I think farming is a secondary, if not tertiary consideration for the devs, as for example with the Ocean Monument, having guardians only spawn in a certain radius around it. Its primary reason is to defend the monument and make it a unique, exciting and challenging place to go out and explore or raid. The fact that it's exploitable for farming is a side effect of that, but one I'm sure the devs were fully aware would be exploited and that they allowed for. The cool thing about it is it gives you a reason not just to explore, but to turn that area you invest all that time and thought and creativity into a significant geographical place in your world. A lot of generated structures don't matter in the sense that once you have raided them, you have little reason to return. You are better off going and finding another one that's generated elsewhere. Once you build a farm on, say, an ocean monument, a witch's hut, a slime chunk, or one of the various other spawner blocks or something like that, then you have a reason to keep on coming back there. And if you have other players on the server, perhaps a reason for them as well. This means that you might have to build your farm in such a way as to present it to other players. You have to connect it up to the other builds and places in your world via a transportation system. Perhaps a nether portal with an ice highway on the other side, or maybe just a building, or maybe just building a nice landing pad for elytra users. On a server full of busy players working away, this means you end up with a vast, interconnected, player-made world. Sure, there's the vastness of the procedural world, but it is the player-made builds that are significant, humming with meaning. Whether that meaning is narrative or mechanical, decorative or even just silly and trivial, or some mixture of the lot. When they all become connected, named places, they become a setting, a living world that stories can unfold in, or stories of the past can be recorded or recounted later. In Minecraft, you can stumble upon a burning, smoking ruin and explain to your travelling companion that these are the ruins of Higalia, Seat of Kings, destroyed by the jealous smokescreen Hella Cool 69 and his band of trolls. And funny internet lingo aside, this kind of emergent storytelling experience is powerful, addictive, enticing stuff. There is no doubt in my mind that well-developed, sophisticated stories full of builds and all the history and lore that goes with them will be valuable. Maybe not monetarily, but you know, probably. When I look at our weird as hell world with procedurally generated NFT monkeys selling for stupid amounts of money, and I think about how guys like FitMC have already made careers out of telling the history and stories generated by the players on the 2B2T Anarchy server, it just seems obvious to me that later there will be huge amounts of value placed onto beautiful, hand-realized Minecraft worlds that can be toured and explored in perpetuity. Even if that value isn't monetary and is just cultural, I think it will be significant all the same. Now would, now would be a good time for me to reference perhaps one of the most famous worlds as an example in this regard, the Uncensored Library. Not-for-profit reporters without borders made a Minecraft world hosting censored journalism from around the world, allowing people from regimes that would not think to ban the game to read the articles. Quoting the executive director of Reporters Without Borders Germany, Christian Meir, from a 2020 BBC article which I've linked in the comments, he said, We chose Minecraft because of its reach. It is available in every country. The game is not censored like some other games which are under suspicion of being political. There are big communities in each featured country. That's why the idea came up. It is a loophole for censorship. I hope this example demonstrates how a Minecraft world can be valuable, but when you think about the diegesis of this, it's even more fascinating. 
They commissioned Blockworks, whose website describes them as a collective of over 60 designers, animators, artists, and developers from around the world. And I reckon they know firsthand how valuable this kind of work is. The Uncensored Library isn't just a loophole for censored articles, it's also an actual representation of a neoclassical library, complete with resplendent white dome, columns, fountains, and things like that. It is such a powerful demonstration of what I'm trying to get at with this video. On a paradigmatic level, we have actual journalism from the real world with real purpose presented in the technical ex execution of the extra diegetic package that is the Minecraft world file that as a player, you log into on a diegetic level and experience as a gigantic classical wonder of the world style library. You can wander around its gardens and wings. If your player didn't intersect with the real world at all, and the articles meant nothing to them, on that diegetic level alone, it is a beautiful and fascinating world to discover, explore and learn from. With the bounty of information and censored journalism, it's a project of significant value to the whole world. I doubt very much it will be the last world file to be distributed as a significant and valuable cultural phenomenon. Just remember to come give me some love when you see the first Minecraft world file go for some ridiculous price at an art auction. Farms don't just dictate the space and locations of the game in a global world file sense, but also in a local, personal sense. Say you build your farm maybe not that far from your base, that you need to use nether portals and ice highways or long elytra flights to get to it. Say it's not within your base, but it's not too far away either, on the outskirts instead. Maybe there's that biome or structure you need for you, your farm just on the other side of a mountain or lake or similar near your base. Sure, right now it's a bit of an island, a build isolated by itself but somewhat nearby. The thing is, in a few months of adding new builds and learning about the game, suddenly the farm isn't so far away anymore. In fact, the space between the edge of your base and that farm seems less like a distance to travel now and more like an awkward strip that if it just had some stuff in it, might make the farm very well become a part of your base, on the edge of your base but incorporated all the same. While this process isn't exclusive to farms and works well with other builds too, because of the various requirements that need to be met for farms, I find that for me personally it happens quite a lot with them. You find a nice skeleton spawner and build a farm on it and it's just far enough away that it's a journey and a structure entirely separate until a few months passed and you've built so much stuff that your base's expansion is fast encroaching on the farm. And one of the only reasons you knew the world well enough to expand it in that direction was because you were traveling to that farm over and over until one day your buildings and terraforming catch up to it. It becomes a new edge to your base and then the next farm over the horizon starts to beckon in your never ending search for good spots to build new things. Spatially, these kind of builds don't just expand and recreate the scope of the game in terms of the whole server come world, but also in terms of your base, your personal building area. Eventually this leads to your base going from being a small, personal hovel with a few useful structures to a sprawling, handmade, capital P, place. This, incidentally, is why I gave up on trying to put walls around my bases. You just end up running out of room and building outside of them anyway. This process works on the micro level too. What do you do when you've got a farm and a house just 10 or so blocks away from each other? Well, you terraform and decorate and garden the space in between, of course. Not that I'm suggesting everyone has to build in a dense, fill up all available spaces kind of way, although that is perfectly valid. But even when you choose to leave space and leave the terrain as it was when the server first generated, by hand making all the builds around it, you recontextualize it and make it your own. That canyon you decided to leave alone because you love the way the vines grow all over, it looks and it also means something very different when it is buried in a naturally generated forest versus when it is surrounded by villager homes and farms that you hand built. Much like how cities grow in real life, the edges naturally attract imaginative minds that say, if we just took the top of that hill and built a platform on that ridge and cleared that bit of forest, made a waterway here and voila, it's a whole new suburb for your Minecraft base. But first you need to be on that edge and looking at that terrain, getting to taste and feel it as it were. And Minecraft naturally has you in those liminal spaces, always imagining and striving for what more there could be. Farms, at least for me, 
are essential in this process. Without them becoming little islands of civilization just over the horizon, I would never expand toward them. The way the farms are bound to certain geographical areas, features or generated structures is what forces me to build them as islands out in the wilderness at all, instead of nestled near the heart of wherever I've decided to settle, which is of course, for the convenience of it, is what I would do if it were entirely up to me where these things located. I know this is because it is precisely what I do with farms that can be built anywhere, like bamboo or sugarcane farms. I build them right at the centre of my base. The devs are clever to have both kinds in the game, as without both, this process would not occur. If you had to build every farm only in spots dictated by the world generation, you would be playing a big world map sized game of join the dots forever. By having both kinds, you can settle in a spot and then expand toward the dots as you progress through the game and unlock more and more abundance and gain access to higher and higher levels of scope and scale at which you can build until eventually you have the kind of immense, detailed worlds on bases that keep people riveted to their YouTube screens, hitting the old like and subscribe. Now that I've spoken a lot on farms, I think it would be an appropriate time to transition into something that I've mentioned a bunch, and I'm sure many out there are surprised I haven't gotten to already, and that's redstone. Redstone is sort of like electricity. It allows you to create and program complex behaviors by essentially transmitting on off signals, or one slash zero if you prefer. A simple example is a button connected to a lamp. Like in real life circuitry, by connecting them together with redstone, you can pre press a button over here and turn on a lamp over there. There are more complex components you can craft that expand its functionality as well. And there are components like hoppers too that aren't exactly like redstone, but are very related to redstone. Redstone allows you to do pretty much anything you can imagine in terms of designing and implementing complicated behaviors and functions into the game. It is obviously a critical component of most, although not all, farms. But you can use it to, say, make automated doors or hidden doors. Or you can use it to make lights turn on when the sun goes down, or fireworks shoot when someone stands on a certain spot, or to make arrows shoot out of the wall when someone trips over a wire in the hallway. And those are just the simple uses, I'm sure, are the basic intentions with the game. When Redstone was first implemented, though, I'm sure the developers being coders and programmers themselves were quite happy to be implementing something into their sandbox game that allowed anyone who had those skills to start constructing some genuinely sophisticated functions and behaviors in, into the game. Crucially, you can use redstone to build things like logic gates and clocks, which in turn means you can build a plethora of things that are normally far outside of the reach or scope of a video game. I'm sure I don't need to tell you if you've watched this far, but people have built fully functional computers with redstone. People have built computers that can run other games on them in Minecraft, which I'm sure by some measures makes Minecraft a Turing complete simulation. If you aren't playing on survival and can make use of the command block, which allows you to execute console commands in conjunction with redstone, and especially if you have third-party mods and resource packs running, there really is basically nothing a player with programming skills and an ability to create their own assets can't do with Minecraft. I myself don't have those skills, and while I have a grip on the basics with redstone, I don't consider myself to be a particularly masterful player with regards to it. I would describe myself as being middling to average. I can follow and understand most basic designs and instructions, enough to build farms and doors and stuff, but I haven't ever really attempted to build anything truly complex, and I will absolutely never design anything original with it. Thus, I don't really think I'm the right guy to go into elaborate discussions about redstone. It is done better by others, but I will spare some time here to speak of the diegesis of it. After all, that's what I'm the real sucker for, and it's the reason I'm making this video. Redstone is, of course, something that, as its name suggests, is a type of rock or stone that you dig up in the game on a diegetic level. Minecraft Steve and Alex dig it up as much as you, the player, does. It's convenient that it is just the one centralized substance in the game and not a whole conglomeration of materials and rare earth metals and such like in real life, but it's Minecraft, not Mining Economy Simulator, so that's definitely a good call. 
enough to make it feel like a diegetic part of the game and not some extracurricular functionality from a menu outside like a game like Fallout 4 does with its electricity analogue. None of this press a button and here's a menu and I can just connect my sparky wires up magically from nowhere while a parts count buried in another menu somewhere goes down. But also you aren't digging up and inventing industrial processes to create the right kinds of alloys and twisted pairs and etc to make a fundamental physical force you're exploiting do the thing you want it to do. No, in Minecraft you just dig up the redstone. Then you can combine it with some other stuff you dug up to, to craft a bunch of components that let you do a few fundamental things. Repeaters, comparators, lamps and the like. And then spatially, the same way you build in Minecraft, you lay it out, connect it up, and if you understand it in reality on the extra diegetic level, probably because you did a bunch of paradiegetic reading and YouTube viewing, then you get a working diegetic redstone machine. Much like farming and a lot of the more esoteric, weird and advanced technical stuff you can do in Minecraft, there is really no diegetic way to understand this. Alex or Steve don't really have a way to go about learning how the red stuff they dig up becomes a machine. That is really where you come in. There's a few things in the game for some of the most basic functionality of the stuff, like pressure plates activating TNT in desert temples, or trip wires hooked up to the dispensers that shoot arrows at you in jungle temples. But how are you meant to get from that to a flying machine or excavation machine or something that builds bridges for you? Well, the devs know as well as you do, you or I do, that to Steve and Alex, it doesn't matter. The strength of the game is that it lets you fill the gaps and make it your own, and that if it had tried to be so prescriptive as to introduce a redstone engineer character named Sam that had a book full of plans he had worked out on a diegetic level, that those plans would have locked the actual player base <clears throat> and its never-ending creativity out of the equation to some degree. Then the devs would have had to make sure that whole feature set was watertight in its explanations and explorations, and there would be little room left for the kind of complexity that results in fully functioning redstone computers. As always, the soft touch with the diegetic expository information and letting the community on the paradiegetic level explore and discover and define the boundaries, standards and methods of redstone pays off for Mojang. When you have hundreds of millions of players, some of them are always going to push the boundaries and figure new stuff out. The people behind Minecraft would be nothing short of suicidal in their enterprise if they were to make such powerful and accessible tools and components like redstone and then go and tell them how you can and can't use them. It'd be like buying a kid one of those Lego robots and then getting mad if they built a tank out of it instead. Redstone, when taken for its narrative potential, is just as meaningful a tool at the player's disposal as building or mining, exploring or anything else. Through Redstone, players get to feel their agency in this world in a whole other way, where their technical knowledge allows them to tame and shape the landscape to their will. If you know what a perimeter is and how you build one, you know just how ridiculous and impactful Redstone can become. The sort of game you play and stories you tell on a server full of players who have excavated vast swaths of land down to bedrock with redstone machines versus a server with players dedicated to building exclusively old castle ruins is like the difference between reading an adventure comic and a technical manual. They are satisfying and interesting to different kinds of people with different kinds of minds, but it's all still Minecraft, baby, and the diegesis does not break for any of it. And that is the real special source behind the zeitgeist. No matter what you do with that little program on your device, you and everyone you are sharing it with are sharing a world and a history together, and those stories remain even a decade later. I have not forgotten my old worlds and my old experiences with my old friends. And heck, if I look through some old hard drives, I might even be able to boot up these worlds and experience it all again. And that is beautiful and worth as much to me as I'm sure it is to most people out there, at least as much as an old photograph or letter, if not much, much more. I'd like to share with you now the world I'm currently working on. Of course, the majority of the footage you've been watching of me flying around has been recorded by me in that same world, but I've been careful not to show you my base because I wanted to make a little section where I get a bit more personal again. My current base is still in the early days. It's sparse. With all I've learned since getting back into the game in 2020, I draw a very long bow nowadays when it comes to building my base. Rather than attempt to build something amazing in the first place, I instead am content to aim 
to have something amazing one day and focus instead on laying all the groundwork and infrastructure first. Things like terraforming, beautifying and tying everything together can wait, probably for quite some time. I do shift work for some absolutely ridiculous hours for not enough money and I don't really have the time to make progress fast in Minecraft. Instead, I like to chip away at it slowly, bit by bit, confident that like the old tortoise from the tortoise and the hare fable, slow and steady will win the race. Not that Minecraft is a race, but I notice that, at least amongst my friends, they hammer Minecraft hard for a month or two and then they get bored and don't play again for a year or so, leaving half-finished builds and abandoned bases. Which is really cool. I love running across this stuff on my server. But I'm a long stayer. For me, Minecraft is almost like gardening. A little visit here and there with the right tools and the right places. And after many a year, you wind up with something almost divine to bask in. As a result, my base is mostly a few key farms. A lot of villages and little boxes awaiting a nice home once I get around to building it. And well, not much else. I have not even gotten around to building myself a home yet. I have a grand vision for the area though, and one day, maybe in a few years on this very channel, I'll get to show it to you. That's the thing about the game, you have the vision, but you know you can't realise it yet, so you put up with something a bit more purely mechanical as a, this will do, until I have the resources and time, and if you're a long term stayer like me, one day you will. Ah, uh, my glorious palace on the mountain will be born by these blocky hands one day. I swear it. One day. I also mostly play alone, but in a third-party SMP server I rent myself. Sure, my friends have builds and some time clocked up in here, but the game just doesn't hold their attention the way it does for me, and I very much enjoy Minecraft as a solitary experience. Not that I wouldn't play it with others or team up and base with people, but with my limited time available thanks to my shift work, this is much easier said than done, as often my sessions have to be at odd hours, others aren't available. I just end up having to be I just end up having to play by myself anyway, so I cut out the middle man and play as if I was by myself even when I'm not. So why not just play single player, you ask? Well, because I intend to build some absolutely heinous cool shit, that's why. And one day I want people to log into my server and discover it and share it with me and be inspired and build their own shit. More than that, I want to be out exploring on my server and come across some other mind-bending cool shit that someone else has built that I had no knowledge of. So I get to experience a sense of play, story and appreciation for them. Sure, currently I don't really have any other active players on my server, but that's okay. One day I probably will. For me, an ideal SMP server would have players quite happy to settle far away from each other, mostly do their own thing, either as small teams or crews or as individuals, so that there become many meaningful, interesting and diverse places to connect up, visit, discover and explore. If everyone all jumps in together all the time, there are no surprises and secrets. The memories and good times are great, but the server as a long-term project is less interesting for it. Well. At the scale of between one to like maybe five or six other players that I'm used to at any rate. I'm sure once you start getting 30 to 50 players or hundreds in a server, this dynamic shifts and teaming up would help facilitate this instead. I have zero experience with the game played that way, however, so I'll refrain from commenting. But if you made it this far and you have that experience, by all means, tell me what you think of your or your story in the comments. So that's it. That's the end of the video. Those are my meditations on the diegesis of Minecraft. I think there's a hell of a lot more to say, but if I ever want to get this channel off the ground, I can't remain bogged down in any one single video forever, especially in these early days. I do hope that you have found what I've had to say interesting and stimulating, and I would be thrilled to hear from you and what you think. Remember to like and subscribe and follow my Patreon. I'll see you on the next one.